Hello? Hi, Shane. Okay, so I know you're all super shocked, but today is Monday, which means that there's an SI session at 8.30 p.m. in Guilford 323 going to 10, 10 o'clock. So you should probably show up. We'll be going over the exam and whatever we learned today because I'm sure we'll be learning something super duper exciting that you all want to spend extra time on because chemistry is super fun. There's also an SI session tomorrow in Bingham 103. I think it's at 4.30. Um, if Amelia shows up and it's not at 4.30, she'll correct me. It's posted at Blackboard, right? And it's also on Blackboard, so if I'm wrong, you can check Blackboard and Blackboard's right. <coughs> All right. First, this is not intended to be a comment that's suggesting you may want or need to do this. However, several people have recently approached me for opportunities for you to earn bonus, so I have a couple for you. The first one is on Friday, there's free food at uh, 12.30 in Strosacker for the Jackson Whitkey Award lecture. Last year's recipients of the Whitkey Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching uh, will be speaking as will the recipients of the Jackson Award uh, for uh, Excellence in Undergraduate Mentoring. Uh, they're going to be talking about how their career has taken them to where they are there will be an expectation that you will write a reflection on this one, should you choose to attend. You're going to get food out of it anyway, but you can earn a bonus point by attending. Um, <coughs> so, and I'll re now remind you of this one on Wednesday. Um, not such a bad idea since you might get to take class from one or more of these people. All but one of them is a faculty member at some point during your career here. So that's one. The second one, is just like donating blood, there is a need to register donors for bone marrow. Um, let me give you a heads up about this one. Typically there is a cost associated with this. And last year when I got asked to do this, I said no because I said I'm not going to ask someone to pay $35 to get a bonus point. The Hillel uh, Student Association is paying the cost for your donation. And you get one of these. Jessica is at bone marrow, on the bone marrow registry. I am on the bone marrow registry. Um, let me caution you on this one. First of all, all you do to sign up is show up, sign your name, address, phone number, contact information, and then they take swabs of your cheek. Um, and then they take those swabs and throw them in an envelope and ship them off to be tested so that they can put you in the database. If you sign up, what you are doing is you are agreeing that should a match be found, you are willing to undergo a somewhat painful procedure um, that may or may not, I mean, when they do the match, what they will do is they will identify a half a dozen to a dozen potential donors. They'll bring them in, they'll do more testing on them, and if you are the donor, from what I'm told, it is a somewhat painful procedure where you are anesthetized prior to donating marrow. Um, so, by agreeing to do this, and this is why I'd like you to think twice about it, and then I'll let you ask your questions. You are consenting, you are saying that you are willing to do this if you are a match. Please do not do this simply to get a bonus point. They are, the Hillel Asso Student Association is particularly looking for Jewish, students of Jewish descent, because as it says down here on the bottom, Representation of Jewish donors in this registry is needed in order to overcome the devastating effects of the Holocaust, which severed bloodlines. The reason why I promote this, quite honestly, is one of my physics students uh, at the high school that I taught at had a bone marrow transplant uh, last May. Um, and uh, I just saw him last Friday. He's doing phenomenally at the moment. Hopefully he will continue to do well. Uh, but bone marrow is the only thing that could be done. Transplanting his, a bone marrow transplant was the only thing that could save his life. So. What if you're already registered? If you're already registered, thank you very much. No, you can't uh, get another point for this. You can't register twice. You just did it like three weeks ago. You just did it three weeks ago. You can send me an email, I'll think about it. Was that the question back there too? I just signed up for it. Um, again, this, has to, this is a, not a decision you make lightly. 
If you're doing it just for the bonus point, please don't. Take this, this is a serious decision, and if you say yes to this, you are agreeing to potentially go undergo a painful procedure. So um, think twice about it. All right? Uh, let's see, is this one my email? This is my email. I better close it. All right. Um, this one. Yes, the test is graded. I know, it's upside down intentionally. If you look hard, you can see it there. Um, the crest test is graded. It is actually posted to Blackboard, but I have not uh, enabled you to see it yet. Um, what I did this time, why it's taken so long, is I have recorded your individual scores from individual questions. I wanted to make sure that no one grader was harsher than they needed to be or easier than they needed to be. If I found out that everybody got eight on one question, I might have gone back and asked that grader, how is it possible that everybody got a perfect score? You can't tell me that I, everybody got it right. I'd like to think I was that good, but I'm not. Um, I'd like to think you were that good, and you are. Uh, but there is a distribution of grades on every question. I was the hardest grader of all of them, and I graded the last question. But I think part of that was several of you left it blank. Um, <coughs> or didn't get to it, perhaps. Uh, so it made my grading easy. If there's nothing on there, then it just says MT, and I scored a zero on the front. So I know the score on every single question on the uh, exam. Um, if you would like your exam regraded, here's the process. Wednesday or Friday of this week, not after Friday, you will put in writing half a page that simply says, I would like this exam regraded for the following reasons. I probably won't read that, but I will regrade the entire exam. Your exam score may go up or it may go down. I will not regrade individual questions. It will be the entire exam and I will do it to make sure that it, was, it is graded consistently on a regrade. So you're welcome to ask me to regrade it, but you won't be able to say, they were too rough on me on question three. You'll have to say, please regrade my entire exam, um, and I will do that. But you have to have those to me by the end of class on Friday, okay? I'll zoom in out so you can see it, relax. <laughs> so, All right, let's take a look at this and see, quite honestly, the average is 71. There's nothing wrong with a 71 average. <laughs> Whoa, time out, folks. As I've said since day one, at the end of the year, I expect the class average to be on everything somewhere between 78 and 80. Usually exam grades are below that, homework brings it up, and the final exam is right around there, okay? And if you look at last semester, you'll find out that even though the exam average on every exam went down, that at the end of the semester, the class average was 78.1. And I had nothing, I did nothing to massage that. When I say I don't curve the class, I don't, those of you thinking about law school, the case law school curves. 10% of the students get A's, 10% get F's. 20% get B's, 20% get D's, and the remaining 40% get C's. That's a curve. If you want me to curve, I'll curve. <laughs> no, I said on day one I will not curve, so I'm not going to. You are earning points towards a final score. The average student in the class earns 71 points towards the final score of this semester on this exam. Now that big spike on the far right hand side, there are 11 students who scored 50 or lower on this test. And yes, there are only two, four, six, seven students who scored 90 or higher, and nobody scored above 93. Um, that's not too surprising for an essay test. The TAs were looking for specific things, looking for complete understanding, and no one had a perfect score. I'm not disappointed with that. Um, it looks, I mean, when you, if you just looked at this, if I took the numbers off of it, and if I were to cut this thing off, everybody would say, oh, that looks great. It's a nice distribution. It's skewed to the high end. Oops, sorry, the high end. 
that's a, I'm looking at it here, so it's hair. Um, it's, the median score was 71, the average was 70.8. It, it's not a bad test. Now, if all of you believe as Garrison Keillor does about Lake Wobegon that everyone is above average, you're wrong. Average is average. It's a 71, it's just a number. I'm not displeased with the exam scores. They look good to me. Now, if you're used to getting 95s on your tests, maybe this one will say, okay, I'm gonna have to do something a little differently on the next one. There will be essay questions on every exam this semester. There will also be calculations on the next one too, so I'm not gonna make the whole test essay again. So, um, in general, it's about right. So, I, I realize that some of you are saying, I needed a perfect score you'll still get one, you still have chance. It's one test, there's three more, there's a final exam, there's paper and there's homework. So I gotta get the homework up and running so you can all feel confident again. So that's what it looks like. I think it looks pretty good, I'm sorry? I'll still take socks today, so um, for those who have them. All right. Why don't you give me some light and get rid of that. Uh, we do have, I do have the exam here, yes? Uh, Wednesday will be the last day I can take socks. I have the exams. I did not seal them this time, so Jessica and I will be handing them back. They are alphabetized and scored. Um, we'll finish at um, 20 till so that we can have 10 minutes to do that, all right? So, we don't have a third, so there's two of us. All right. Moving on to chapter 15. Let me know when you're ready, folks. Won't work. I understand it can be rough to see a score like that. It doesn't mean that there's not some people who want to be here. If you'd rather not, attendance is optional. I've said that from day one. But if you're going to be here, I would ask that you respect your classmates. You can get up at any time and leave. It does not offend me. It does bother me when you're distracting the people who want to be here. So, I'll tell you what. 
I'll turn around and count to 10. If you'd like to leave, feel free. After that, we'll get going, all right? Thank you. All right, chapter 15 on chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium is where we're going to start to have to think about the fact, as we, started to, or as we started talking about, that chemical reactions don't always start with reactants and end with products, or that chemical reactions always start with reactants and end with products, but which is the reactant and which is the product? And when you stop and think about that for a second, If I take a nice simple reaction with two NO2 molecules reacting together to form N2O4, which is the reactant? Is it NO2 or is it N2O4? Because the way this reaction is written, I could start with N2O4 and make NO2. Every single chemical reaction has an opportunity to react from right to left or from left to right. And what we're going to try and figure out is, is there some way we can predict which one's more likely? Now, if we were to go back to kinetics for a second and take the reaction that's written on the top there, and we assume that it happens in one step. So it's an elementary reaction. Two NO2s come together to form N2O4. We could write a rate expression for that reaction, which is just the forward rate of the reaction is equal to the rate constant in the forward direction, as it's written over there, times the concentration of NO2 squared. If I take the second reaction, or the reverse of the reaction, I could write that the rate of the reaction in the reverse direction, reverse being according to that first equation over there, is the rate constant times the concentration of N2O4. At some point, the forward rate is going to be equal to the reverse rate. And that will always be true. For every single chemical reaction, there comes a point in time when the forward rate will equal the reverse rate. And you'll get no more increase in products, or the thing on the right, than, than the rate at which it's used up. And so if that's true, we can simply write that expression. It's OK, there's not much to it, but let's just rearrange it so that all of the constant terms, remember this is just a rate constant. It's a fudge factor. It's the slope of the line of when you plot change in concentration as a function of time. But put all the constants together. And we get that. The ratio of the forward rate constant to the reverse rate constant is equal to the concentration of N2O4 divided by the concentration of NO2 squared for this reaction. And for any chemical reaction, if you take the ratio of the forward rate constant to the reverse rate constant, you can do this. Well, these two are just constants. So let's call that a new constant, some constant K. And we're going to see lots of these constants. So I'm going to tell you that this one depends on concentration. So we're going to put a subscript C on it. From now until shortly after break, you're going to see lots of constants, these capital K constants. And they're all going to get a different subscript. C, let's see if I can make a list of all the ones you'll have. We'll have two today. My 
I missing any? KC, KP, KA, KB, KW, KSP, KF, KEQ. None more, none of that jump out at me right away. Every, I'm sorry, KA's up there. Every single one of those is the ratio of the forward rate constant divided by the re, uh, reverse rate constant. The subscript just tells you a little bit more about those rate constants. So this first one tells you that it's a ratio of concentrations. This one tells you it's a ratio of pressures. This one tells you it's acids, bases. This W stands for water. This one is solubility product, which we're going to get to a little bit later. This one stands for formation. And this one is the generic one, equilibrium. All of these are equilibrium constants. They're all equal to the ratio of the two rate constants. I don't have which one? What, where did you hear of KR? K forward and K reverse. Notice the difference between the lowercase and uppercase. So that's why. So that, and so the KF I didn't have over there. I did have a KF, but it's a different F. Okay. There is, uh, when we get, uh, as we move on a little bit, and I think we've already seen this a little bit, we've talked about the difference between uppercase variable names and lowercase variable names. Uppercase variable names are state functions. They don't depend on how you get from point A to point B. They just care what is the initial and what is the final state. Lowercase uh, variables depend upon the path you take to get from point A to point B. So the amount of heat, Q, that you put into a reaction depends upon how you do it. If you stir it, if you heat it with a Bunsen burner, if you microwave it. But the total energy change when you undergo a reaction doesn't depend upon how you do that. So we've already seen that a little bit. The nice thing about these equilibrium constants is that for any chemical equation, any balanced chemical equation, you can write the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant for this first reaction is just the concentration of the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficient, in this case, one. divided by the concentration of the reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficient. The rate constant for the bottom reaction is the same thing, except now if I compare these two, and I'll put a prime on one of them just to differentiate the two of them, Kc, is just the reciprocal of Kc prime. That'll be true for any chemical reaction. The rate constant for the reverse reaction is just one over the rate constant for the forward reaction. And for absolutely every equation, that will be true. What if I tell you that the value of this rate constant, I'm just going to make up a number, is 10 to the fourth. What does that tell you about the forward rate versus the reverse rate? Which one is faster? Forward rate. Because it's such a large positive number, KF is bigger than KR. The forward rate is going to be greater than the reverse rate. Anytime K is greater than 1, and it doesn't matter which of these Ks I talk about, you're going to get more products. If k is less than 1, you don't get very many products. And every single equilibrium constant we talk about from now until April, that will be true. To give you some generic values, these two, kc and kp, can have any value whatsoever. There's very, very little restriction on them. Ka and Kb 
will typically be on the order of 10 to the minus 5. Kw is 10 to the minus 14. KSPs are approximately 10 to the minus 10. And these are general rules. They're not hard and fast. KF are 10 to the positive 20th. KEQ, well, that's all of them. So it can have any value whatsoever. But as we start to do more and more of these, you're going to start to see that we stick with those kind of values throughout. Now, for any chemical reaction that's balanced, we can write, as soon as we have the balance equation, the equilibrium constant for that reaction. The easiest one is the one that depends on concentration. So just from the balance equation, I can write the concentration of the products, ammonia, raised to their stoichiometric coefficient. I can't even read my balance equation. That should be a 2. Divided by the concentration of the reactants, raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, one and three in this case. The back one's broken. Well, oh, that's no good. Oh, that's all right. We remember that equation, I hope. When is it used? Only for gases. Thank you. You can, you can never use it for anything other than a gas. But if you have a gas, you can rearrange this one. Did I do that right? Nope, I didn't do that right. N over V equals T over RT. For any gas, the concentration of the gas is just its pressure divided by R divided by T. So if I come over here, since I've only got gases over here, everywhere there's concentration, I'm going to substitute pressure over RT. So K for that reaction is the pressure of ammonia over RT squared. Here I've got the pressure of nitrogen over RT and the pressure of hydrogen over RT cubed. So all I've done is substituted what I know. For gases, pressure divided by RT is going to be equal to concentration. And now I can simplify this one. Factor out all the pressure terms. And I've got if I did my algebra right, RT to the fourth oh, and RT to the uh, squared. And so I can simplify this once more. All those pressure terms. That's just an equilibrium constant using pressure units instead of concentration units. It's the pressure of the ammonia gas raised to the second divided by the pressure of nitrogen gas divided by the pressure of hydrogen gas cubed. So instead of using concentration, you could use pressure. But you've got all these RTs to worry about still. we've got a simple relationship between Kc and Kp for that specific reaction. What does it look like for water and hydrogen and oxygen to make water? Yeah. 
if we start with hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to make water gas, we could write a Kc. which is just the concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, products over reactants. Or we could write a Kp, which is the same generic equation, except now it's in pressure instead of concentration. Problem is Kc and Kp are different values. If we do exactly what we did the last time, we would get plugging in pressure over R times T, wherever there's concentration, pulling out all the common terms. So you can see that the pressure of water squared, the pressure of hydrogen squared, the pressure of oxygen is just Kp again. Now the 1 over RT squared here will cancel with the 1 over RT squared here, leaving me with 1 over RT. So it's going to be Kp times RT. Notice it's different than this one. How does it work? In general, and why do I have a negative side missing? Products minus reactants, do, 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 go minus two. There's got to be a minus sign right there. It says Kp equals Kc, or excuse me, Kc equals Kp times Rt raised to the negative delta Ng. Am I missing one? Well, this one over Rt squared will cancel with this negative 1 over RT squared. And I get a 1 over RT in the denominator here, so that's why it came to the numerator. Did I do that right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I did my algebra right. In general, if there's a change in the number of moles of gas, Kc and Kp will not be equal to each other. If the number of moles of gas stays constant, you'll find out that Kc and Kp are equal to each other. Here we went from four moles of gas, nitrogen plus three hydrogen, to two moles of gas. There's the two. And here we went from three moles of gas to two, so there's a change in one mole of gas. And if we define change as the final minus the initial, we, went, we ended up with two moles of water. We started with three, so the change in the number of moles is negative one. So when you raise it to the negative delta n, the change in the number of moles of gas, that's what this is saying. That's how we ended up with the times RT over there. Now, I think your book defines delta n as saying this is 4 minus 2 is 2. The only problem I have with that is every other time we've talked about changes as being pro final minus initial. And so that's why I have a negative sign on mine, and your book has a positive sign. Okay. As long as you, if, if, you all, if you always can just go back to doing the longhand of derivation, you won't have a problem with it. It'll work out just fine. I'm never going to ask you to compare Kc to Kp. I might ask you if they're the same or not, but I'm not going to ask you to convert a Kc to a Kp. It's a simple algebra problem. All of these equations so far,
have been homogeneous equilibrium. In other words, every single compound is in the same phase. They're all gases. What happens if I mix them now? Calcium carbonate will decompose to give you calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. You can write an equilibrium constant for this. That looks like that. The equilibrium constant, depending on concentration, is just the concentration of the products raised their stoichiometric coefficients, divided by the concentration of the reactants, raised their stoichiometric coefficients. There's a problem here, though. If I've got a pile of calcium carbonate, that's some size, and I want to get its concentration, it's just the number of moles or the mass that I've got, divided by its volume. As this thing reacts, what happens to that pile of calcium carbonate? It gets smaller, right? You're using up calcium carbonate. As it gets smaller, what happens to the number of moles? It gets smaller. What happens to the volume? It gets smaller. Are they related to each other? Yes. For every one mole that I lose, I lose an exact a certain amount of volume. If I lose another mole, I lose the same volume. What happens to the concentration of that cube versus this cube? They're the same. Well, if the concentration's the same, then I don't have to worry about them. If the concentration doesn't change in the reaction, there's nothing going on. It's essentially a constant. And so let's lump all those constants together. So now all the constant terms are on one side of the equation. And the thing that's changing is on the other. And for any heterogeneous equilibrium that involves solids, the solids can all be lumped into this equilibrium constant because they don't change, they're constant. And so the equilibrium is just going to depend upon the concentration of CO2 or since it's the only gas, the pressure of CO2. We're going to talk more about this one on Wednesday, but writing equilibrium constants when you've got solids in them, just ignore the solids. The same will be true for pure liquids, and I'll show you an example of that on Wednesday. You want to take half of these, Jessica? Jessica's going to take the first half of the alphabet up through M. And I have the 